So, Greg Kitzroth is with the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant and the Illinois Natural History Survey. He's going to talk about the uh, Be a Hero campaign. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Be a Hero and some other stuff too. So, got lots of lots of things to cover in 20 minutes. Um, so, if you didn't know, invasive species are a problem. Um, aquatically speaking, there's 187 different species that are established in the Great Lakes currently. Um, so that number keeps rising, um, and so they're not all invasive, that just means that they're established and they're there, they're doing their thing, some are causing problems. Um, about a quarter of them have actually been introduced through uh, 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 organisms in trade, and I'll talk a bit about that. Um, if you're not familiar, this is an invasive species curve, um, so um, pretty much what you see on the x-axis is time, on the y-axis is area and Vested right there, and then control costs. So pretty much what this graph is telling you that over time, the area is gonna increase for invasive species and then also the control cost. So what I do is I, I live in this little section right here called uh, prevention. So really, if you can prevent the introduction of species, that's much more cost effective than trying to manage uh, things that have come out of the bag. Uh, so <coughs> containment was talked about a little bit earlier uh, with Nick's talk, and then eradication for uh, uh, wild pigs. Um, so these are very expensive. Uh, I don't get paid nearly as much as the amount of money that goes into, say, sea land prey control in the Great Lakes, which every year is about $16 million. Um, so this is also another model for invasive species. So this is transportation. So species has to be introduced by people or uh, some human-mediated <coughs> means for this model. Um, so transportation to a new location where they've never been before. Um, introduction. So they have to be uh, introduced into the environment, established, so able to reproduce, uh, spread unaided, and then have impact. So really, this is where we focus is on the transportation and introduction side of things. Um, so a lot of my work uh, over the last seven years is focused on what we call organisms in trade. So these are essentially aquarium species and water garden species um, that get introduced intentionally or accidentally through uh, trade. Um, and it's seen as one of the main ways in which uh, aquatic species are being introduced into the Great Lakes or even the Great Lakes states currently. Uh, ballast water has been implicated in a lot of species introductions previously, but with a lot of uh, effective ballast water treatment, uh, there has been uh, concern about um, species being brought in through trade, so people like novel organisms, and so the influx of organisms continues uh, today. Um, so to look at the prevention side of things, we look at how people use them, but also how people are disposing of them. So really, like if you have an aquarium, it's kind of a closed system. If you keep your fish in that aquarium, it's going to stay in that aquarium. So really, it's the disposal side of things that we are concerned about. So we worked with the Department of Natural Resources and we created the Be Hero Release Zero campaign. So really what we're asking people to do is to take their plants uh, and bag them and put them in the trash. Uh, if you don't properly compost all your plant and plant bits, you can spread around some invasive species. Animals, we're asking people to rehome them or uh, seek advice on humane disposal. And then water to disinfect or repurpose. Um, and a lot of this is focused on different audiences within the organisms and trade pathways. So aquarium hobbyists, water gardeners, uh, people who use live bait, and then teachers, so classroom pets, um, all get released. And then we base this off of guidelines that exist for the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, which is a federal uh, task force, and then the Habitatitude Campaign, which has been developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We created a bunch of uh, outreach materials, such as posters, to be hanging in aquarium shops, uh, three-panel displays to be uh, presented at trade shows. We, so we talked to people about not releasing their pets. Um, we also uh, just don't deliver educational information. We think about how to deliver that educational information. So that's part of uh, outreach, is that we don't just provide educational materials and expect people to change their behavior just because they know. because. Who hasn't heard that smoking is bad for your health? And how many people know that someone is smoking? So that's a, that's a disconnect that a lot of people have that education equals behavior change, which isn't always the case. So we work with people like Erin uh, Seacamp at North Carolina State University, and she did what's called a needs assessment. So looking at what we want people to be doing, so not dumping their pets in Lake Michigan, versus what they are doing, up in Lake, uh, their pets in Lake Michigan, and try to figure out how to bridge that gap. So is it, is it a behavior change, or is it something that has to be enforced? Um, 
So really what we found from this needs assessment that was done in, I think, 2012 was that um, people really listen to retailers uh, of these audiences. So um, if you go to an aquarium shop, people are listening to that uh, aquarium owner or um, retailer. And so really, uh, we want to uh, work with retailers to provide this educational materials because they're seen as a authority, essentially. Um, often I hear in the last seven years, if it's a problem, then why can I buy it? So there's this misconception that even though I, you can buy an organism, doesn't mean that it's not uh, potentially invasive. So everyone believes that uh, invasive species are prohibited across the board, which is not true for various reasons. And even if that was true, um, there's always new things that are coming in. People don't know what's going to be invasive. But also, some things accidentally make their way to trade. Um, I've seen ram's horn snails. Has anyone ever heard of these? They look like a ram's horn. They look like a little snail. Um, being sold as a species, it's a, it's a shape of snail. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different species of ram's horn snails being sold as one individual species. So it's a very confusing mess uh, that sometimes happens with uh, the sale of organisms. Um, so to try to work on that a little bit, uh, we partnered with uh, Notre Dame, Lyle in Chicago, and the Nature Conservancy, and they did what's called a risk assessment. So they looked at biological, biological characteristics of species to look at what species are likely to be invasive um, based on their biology. So what will survive, what has high rates of reproduction, how do they reproduce, what do they eat. Um, and so they created a list of high impact species and then low impact species. So we essentially created publications saying, okay, so these are some things that you can buy that are likely to be invasive if you release them. Just be aware that these are things that could be problematic. We try to steer people towards things, especially if you have a, a garden outside, to grow native or non-invasive species. So really, we try to go with the native route. And these are things that we distribute to retailers throughout Illinois. Um, and so mostly, we get a lot of buy-in from independent retailers. Um, the big box stores don't really have a lot of interest in what we're doing, unless we have a little more backing. So we've had a lot more success on mom and pop shops. So about 40 or 90% of the people that we approach typically will take our materials and talk to their customers about invasive species. Um, so these are some folk that have uh, agreed to um, hang things like posters or distribute materials. It's kind of wide ranging what people are willing to do. Some people just want to have a couple brochures at their register. Some people are willing to go whole hog and put up posters. Uh, they've asked me to give talks inside their stores. Like some people are really into invasive species prevention. Um, so years ago, we made a, uh, with the Sea Grant Law Center in Mississippi, um, a non-technical summary of Illinois laws uh, about aquatic species, and essentially it's a, just a breakdown of what you can uh, buy and sell in Illinois. Um, and we sent this to a bunch of shops, about 118. Uh, we also sent in surveys asking retailers about their um, engagement with their customers about invasive species. We got about 19 uh, Surveys returned. If you know anything about surveying, that's actually pretty standard, about 10%. Um, so about 90% said that they would talk with about AIS customers, uh, talk to customers about AIS. So this is pretty similar to what we're seeing when we're going to individual retailers and handing them posters. About 90% were willing to do this. Um, 63 said that they would avoid selling AIS in the future, which was a little disheartening. That was a little bit lower than we were expecting. And then 32% said that they would accept unwanted organisms from customers. So pretty much like if someone wants to rehome a pet, where do they take it? We often say take it back to the retailer that you bought it from, but only about 32% <laughs> were really willing to do that. So that was a little bit disheartening. Um, so considering how important retailers are for this pathway, we started thinking about how to um, essentially um, incentivize this process. So how do we get retailers to participate more? So besides just hanging a poster or maybe having a stack of brochures by a door for years that no one takes, I've seen that happen, um, how do we actually get people to be more uh, engaged? And so we went around to a bunch of retail shops and asked people pretty standard questions like, how do we get you more engaged? Um, so we got a lot of retailer feedback. And then we started thinking about, OK, so can we make this a certification type program? So can we get people to do certain things? And can we then provide some incentives for them to do those things? Um, and so really what we heard a lot is that people don't want to be the only one participating in AIS prevention as far as retailers go. Because these are businesses. So they want to make money. Uh, it's actually the reason that they exist. Um, uh, and 
if they are the only ones doing the right thing and not selling potentially invasive species in this region, um, but their uh, competitor is, uh, they're losing the business directly for that species, but potentially other uh, uh, merchandise as well. So if you want water hyacinth and you're one guy saying like, okay, I won't sell it because there's some concern behind it, but the guy down the road is going to sell it, you're losing customers, not just for water hyacinth, but for other materials. And so not being the only ones was a big concern of theirs. Um, some of these places I've only found recently through Yelp. And so advertisement was a, a very big part. So I've been doing this again for seven years and six years. Some of these places went under my radar. I live in Chicago and there's like five or six of retailers I never knew about until I plunged the depths of Yelp. Um, so a little bit of advertisement, I think we've gone a long way through them. And people mostly agree. Uh, so aquatic invaders in the marketplace are taking aim.org website is probably where we're gonna house this information. So we're gonna try to get people to be uh, advertised to this website saying that they are participating in certain elements of the invasive species prevention pathways. Um, then we're gonna advertise a hobbyist. So we do a lot of trade shows. We'll probably advertise this program to uh, hobbyists. So try to get people who are concerned about invasive species to go to certain shops, try to uh, incentivize people to participate in that way. Um, create in-store displays such as a uh, list of prohibited species in the state. So often, uh, if there's a new species that's prohibited, uh, customers will come in and ask the retailer uh, for that species. And if they don't have uh, something to point to, it becomes kind of a confusing mess for the retailer. Um, so people try to go down the road and buy, buy another um, retailer, or they even go online. So this is a nice little way of uh, describing what is potentially invasive or regulated in the state. And then incentivized for the stores, so fish bags. Uh, so a lot of aquarium stores still need fish bags to send their fish home in. So we have nice branding, getting a message out that way. Um, aquarium thermometers, if you didn't see them on the table, there's some out there if you want one. Um, but it's also a giveaway for retailer uh, hobbyists. Um, and really what we want is we also want retailers to take a training. They are notoriously hard to uh, get to come to trainings. We posted workshops before for retailers and nobody came. Um, because typically if it's a mom and pop shop, the person who owns the shop is the person who's running the register or running the aquarium. So typically like they're working six, seven days a week. So it's really hard to get people out of their shops. So this is one way in which we're trying to get people to uh, take a little bit of training, uh, talk about invasive species, especially if they are the authority on the invasive species, it's really important to uh, make sure that we have a pretty solid message for them. Um, we've got a lot of feedback that the Be A Hero uh, messaging uh, is great. Uh, the animal part is a little more difficult. Plants, everyone has a plastic bag, everyone has a trash can. Uh, water, you can always water more plants in your with that. But finding a new home or humane disposal is a little more tricky for a lot of people. Some people aren't comfortable um, disposing mainly of their own organisms, or even like where to go to rehome an animal. Like not a lot of people know. Um, so we essentially again went back to the retailers and said, okay, so which of you all are going to be willing to take back pets, and can we also advertise that as a potential resource for people? Um, and about 90% of the people that we were able to talk to said yes. Um, but the other side of that is that a lot of people were non-responsive on this front. Um, so I would go, I would talk to the wrong person, I'd be put off to somebody else, um, I'd give them calls, and about 50% of people kind of put us off. So that's pretty similar to what we were seeing with that survey that we did a while ago. So about 50% of people aren't really interested in taking on more pets. There's a lot of uh, things that people are concerned about. So. If you buy a red-tailed cat, if you're not familiar, typically you buy red-tailed cats, they're about this big. If you're really good at keeping it, they can be about this big. Um, so it's really hard to tell people to rehome that, especially if you bring it to a retailer, unless they have, what, like a 100-gallon tank. Like, that's really hard for the retailer to do that. Um, so there's a lot of concerns about what would the retailer even do with these things. Um, so there's a little bit of that. Um, so to kind of go along that line of like uh, alleviating that stress on uh, retailers, we hosted uh, pet take back events. So these are essentially, has anyone heard of the pet amnesty um, events in Florida? Okay, so no hands. 
Right, so um, Florida, every time they uh, regulate a prohibited species, they would find that species uh, dumped into their natural areas. Um, so people would freak out and get rid of what they thought was going to be a jail sentence for them. Um, and so that was not really what they intended with that regulation. So what they ended up doing is having pet amnesty days where people can bring in their unwanted pets. Um, so we hosted a few events like that uh, for aquatics specifically in Illinois and a couple in Indiana. Um, and it was a very interesting process. Uh, when we talked to people about it, what we heard was, okay, what happens when you get a tiger? <laughs> Granted, Florida people brought tigers to those events, so it's a valid point. Uh, what happens when you get a box of cobras? Valid point. What happens if you have kids helping you uh, volunteer at these events and someone brings an alligator and the alligator eats that child? <laughs> these are literally questions that we were asked while going through this process. <laughs> Um, so we worked with a lot of people. So we worked with people within our organization, so Sea Grant and the Illinois Natural History Survey. Uh, we worked with the University of Illinois Legal. Um, that, that was where the alligator question came from. Um, uh, Department of Natural Resources, uh, Conservation Police Officers, the AIS unit, which was great. They were really helpful. Um, biologists within the DNR, uh, people who uh, write the regulations uh, or even permits. Illinois Department of Agriculture, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they were the ones who were going to take the tiger for us. Um, aquarium Fish Sanctuary, this is Aquarium Fish Sanctuary. I like to point out Manny, he's great. He, uh, he runs a nonprofit called the Aquarium Fish Sanctuary, who does this, what we did five times uh, year round. Um, so he takes unwanted fish and puts them in a VA, his girls and boys clubs in Chicago. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, Aquarium Fish Sanctuary, he's a great guy. Um, the Chicago Herpetological Society gave us a lot of help by having great displays at our events, so we've turned them into educational events as well as take-back events. Uh, the Green Bay Aquarium Society, they hosted these similar things in Wisconsin, and so they helped us set this up. And then the Humane Indiana Wildlife Center um, in, in northern Indiana um, actually allowed us to do events in Indiana, um, because I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, because we got things like native species that potentially shouldn't have been um, uh, taken anyhow. So people confused what they found, uh, turtles roaming natural areas as being someone's escaped pet. Um, to, I mean, this is a snapping turtle, like it's a cute little snapping turtle. <laughs> um, was fine where it was, but some um, kind citizen uh, thought they were doing something good, uh, brought it home, fed it a bunch of like really tasty shrimp, it's probably the best time. That turtle just had in its life. Um, but that's not very sustainable for this guy, because like eventually you'll have a big turtle. Um, but we also got some pretty benign things like goldfish, um, overly reproductive uh, mystery snails, really big plecos, a silver dollar fish, so typical things that you'd find in aquariums. And so we put a lot of effort into these events. It was a lot of work, and we got pretty okay things. It was interesting. Um, but really, we put a lot of like retrospectively, we would put a lot more emphasis on the network, so the organizations that are there year-round that will take back these pets. Um, okay, so that's all I have for organisms of trade. So this is a big smattering of the things that we've been doing. So I mentioned before, um, that was more the introduction side of things, so that was unique things that have been transported here intentionally and then are being introduced. So now I'm gonna focus more on transportation side of things a little bit on what we're doing on that front. So very similar to release zero, transport zero. Uh, we are trying to get people to clean their boats, essentially. So once a species is here, um, you can prevent the spread from uh, one infested area to another infested area, uh, to uh, prevent new infested areas from happening by cleaning your boats or not dumping your live bait. Um, clean your gear. So. If you're in a lake that has, say, Eurasian water milfoil, um, and you take your boat through that lake, and then you don't clean your boat, and you go to a new lake, that new lake has a high potential for having Eurasian water milfoil on it. So we tell people to remove plants and animals, uh, mud from their boats, drain all water, so that's lives, live well and bilges, uh, drain, dry everything thoroughly with a towel. Um, and for the most part, like people have gotten the message. We've done some surveying. About 95% of people are doing parts, or if not all of it. Um, but the people who aren't doing it, are they have some reasons for why they're not doing it. And one of the reasons that we found was that people felt rushed at the boat launches. So you take your boat out of the water, um, 
there's less of time to clean your boat. Um, so people feel rushed to get out of the way um, because there are other people wanting to use that boat launch. So they'll just drive off and not even bother <coughs> dealing with it. And so we essentially created um, areas that are labeled and designated to remove plants and animals um, from your boats. So we are calling these aquatic invader removal zones. Uh, this type of program has happened in other states. Uh, so Wisconsin and Minnesota have a pretty good representation. Um, so we created a four by eight sign to be uh, put at boat launches. That's a pretty big sign. That's bigger than this. Um, to remind people to clean their boats, we have some stencils that we put down to tell people where the areas are that they should be um, removing, draining, and drying from. Um, so we have, so this is a boat launch at uh, North Point Marina. Uh, so we put down some stencils there, sign there, some stencils over here, sign there. And this is typically where people would tie down their boat. So it's reminding people in the point where they can have some time to do these activities to do that behavior. So really that was um, what we were finding through survey work was that people felt rushed to get out of the way. And again, we're trying to address not just providing educational materials, but like how do we provide those educational materials in a way that elicits behavior change. Um, right now we have two partially installed. Surprisingly, this poor weather has made painting very hard for the stencils. So we have signs up at Waukegan Harbor and North Point Marina along with Michigan. We have two additional locations that we are looking to install, uh, a little bit more inland in Lake and Cook Counties. Um, we are doing some surveys, again, to see whether or not these are effective the way that we're setting them up, whether or not there are things that we can provide people to make it more effective for them. So do we need to provide the, these people with a broom or like maybe it's a, like a long stick to like get the plants under the boat? So we need, we're looking to find, figure that out. And then we're going to create a manual to disseminate <laughs> widely throughout the state so people can um, install these into their private boat launches too. Um, so if you have a lake management association around your house, this is something that you can do. Um, so that's another program that we're working on. Uh, okay, so again, this is a bit of a smattering of a couple of years worth of work. And so now I'm going to talk about something that I don't know much about, so please don't ask me questions about the next five slides. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, um, I'm actually going to walk over here and read from the computer too, so I'm very sorry, this is going to be kind of boring, but we uh, characterize invertebrate bait um, throughout Illinois. Um, so pretty much we were asked whether or not we knew anything about whether or not anglers are using uh, invertebrate bait. Like we know crayfish, worms, and fish are pretty well described for this pathway. So um, some crayfish that have been used for fishing are invasive, uh, rusty crayfish come to mind. Worms and like earthworms or composting worms we know are invasive have been used for bait. Uh, some fish definitely, um, so this is all very well documented, but what about insect larvae? Um, so Pat Charleboy visited about 38 stores in Illinois, uh, talked to a bunch of people, uh, figured out that most of the stores are getting their bait or invertebrate bait from six um, dis distributors. Uh, so we got a very good sampling of what is in Illinois. Um, we also did some surveying of uh, anglers and found that most people save the bait until it's dead. So they just keep it forever. Um, some people will put it in the trash when they're done. And then this is the concerning part. So people will dispose of bait by dropping it in the water or putting it on the ground. The sharing's fine, but these two are the ones that we're concerned about. So that is introducing organisms into areas where they haven't been before, possibly. Um, so we also collected some of the bait. Uh, we worked with Marty Berg at Wyoming University to identify um, the insects. And so we didn't find a whole lot of very interesting things, um, but what we did find was that uh, there are some species that are not native to the US. Um, so superworms um, are dark lean beetle larvae. Um, so this is what you fish with and this is what you get when it pupates. Um, so it's native to South America, not native here, but it is here already. <laughs> so that's something that's, um, it's being introduced, but it's, it's been here. Um, so it's not brand new to this area. Waxworms, again, it's a um, bee moth or greater, greater bee moth or, or pyrillid moth. Um, 
I'm a botanist by training, so this is like way outside my, my realm of comfort. <laughs> um, so it's native from Eurasia, um, but it's considered a pest globally because of how it impacts honeybee colonies. Uh, butterworms are the larvae of cosmid moss, so this is considered potentially problematic. Um, they're hard to grow, so typically people import them from Chile, where they're native to. Um, but before they get brought here, they get irritated um, to kill bacteria and prevent pupation. So in theory, it shouldn't be a problem. But these are the three things where we're like, okay, so there's some potential for this pathway to be an issue. So people are buying bait and dumping these worms, and the worms are poorly described in some cases. And finally, to keep you all uh, not chomping at the bit to eat lunch, uh, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. So this is another initiative that we've created with uh, funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So we're looking really at crayfish as a group of species that are of concern for this region. Um, so crayfish, uh, if you didn't know, there are 39 different species of crayfish in the Midwest, according to uh, the Crayfish of the Midwest book from the Natural History Survey. Um, there are about 600 different species internationally. Um, so there are two that we are concerned about right now in the Midwest. So that's rusty crayfish and red swamp crayfish. Um, so we are starting to see new populations of red swamp crayfish pop up. Michigan right now is dealing with a few of them. Um, Wisconsin, DNR spent about a million dollars controlling two populations um, in retention ponds in that state. So we are uh, collaborating across the Great Lakes states to figure out who are the crayfish experts, who are managing crayfish, uh, who's selling crayfish, and how can we prevent new introductions of crayfish through various pathways like bait, or classrooms, or aquariums, or even water gardens, um, live food. So if you ever eat crayfish etouffee, that is red swamp crayfish, the one I just mentioned. So that's a potential uh, pathway of introduction. So we want to figure out what we can do about that. And so we have meetings every six months or so um, in partnership with the Aquatic Nuisance Species Great Lakes Panel, um, Great Lakes Commission. Um, so it's a every six month panel. Um, so we partner with them to host these meetings and talk about crayfish. If you're interested in crayfish, uh, please visit our website, invasivecrayfish.org. Um, and so, oh, one more final note. Uh, I talked a lot about aquatics, but we also have the terrestrial bee hero. So if you're interested in outreach and working with us, uh, we always try to promote this. We haven't actually, we don't really delve into terrestrial species very often. So we don't really have time to push this brand, but if you're interested in it, using it in your agency's work, um, let us know. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Martin Berg, who did a lot of that taxonomy that I don't understand, uh, Sarah Zach, Danielle Hilbrick, Lisa Kim, Kelsey Berg. I've all worked with us in the past in these projects. Uh, Joel Davenport is our graphic designer who does uh, a lot of work for us. Um, and all these funding agencies and partners and collaborations and if you have any questions, uh, this is my contact information. I am leaving after these questions, so please feel free to contact me um, uh, either on my phone or my email. So with that, I'll take questions. Yeah. I was wondering if you're working with the forest reserves that have boat docks for them to have feeding areas. Um, yeah, so the question was whether or not we're working with forest reserves. Um, Yes, we are working with Lake County and Cook County right now to figure out whether or not there is uh, space available for us to put those boat, um, zones in. Um, so, to be changed. So, but it seems promising. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, uh, international shipping, the uh, tankers dumping their yeah. ballast water and bringing in the basis species? Yeah, so um, so a lot of the regulation has been pretty effective for ballast water. Um, so typically, ballast waters get discharged outside of the Great Lakes. There's a little bit of concern about ballast water moving things around the Great Lakes currently. Um, so there's some uh, looking at whether or not there is a way to treat the water on side of the ship or even on the dock side. Um, but within the last seven years of this, I think I've heard about three species being introduced um, and established, and those are rotifers, so they're very small organisms. Um, so it's been pretty effective. Um, there is some new legislation that's been passed recently that um, 
I don't know a whole lot about, and I hear it's uh, muddy in the water a little bit on that. But yeah. Are there snakeheads in Illinois yet? Not that I know of. There is one uh, one off that was caught, um, I think by Lake Calumet, but that was a long time ago. Often we hear reports of snakehead, like I have a snakehead mount that I'll take to shows, and people will point and say that I catch these all the time. And typically they mean bowfin or dogfish, so there are lookalikes that get reported pretty frequently. But uh, northern snakehead, which is the one that would survive uh, in this region, has not been found as far as I'm 